During the lunch interval on the Saturday of every test match in England, we invite a well-known guest into the commentary box for a bit of a chat about themselves and their passion for cricket. Some turned out to be quite able cricketers themselves, but they all had fascinating stories to tell about matches they'd seen and cricketers they'd met, and one or two had some interesting, almost heretical theories about how the game should be played or the laws changed. I've chosen just eight from this series of talks, starting in 1980, when Ben Travers, then aged 94, climbed the 79 steps to our box at the top of the Lord's Pavilion during the second test against the West Indies. When I asked him, did he see his first game of cricket? Uh, well, the first test match, I, I think it was the first first class, uh, first class match I saw, the first test match I saw was at the Oval in 1896. Yeah. Uh, I was nine years old, and my father took me. Well, uh, it was three-day matches, of course, in those days. It started on a Thursday, this, and they, uh, uh, they ra it rained most of the first day. They didn't start until after tea. And uh, W. G. Grace and F. S. Jackson opened for England, followed by Ranji, Ranji oh, Singh. Rather, it shows that crowds were still enthusiastic in those. I remember when Ranji came in to bat, they started singing. <laughs> I think he only made seven. It was a very low-scoring match. And that was my... What my, did WG make? Do you remember? Uh, 24, Court Trot Bowl Giffen. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, he was out first. Uh, then Jackson played very good luck. But uh, England won eventually. It was bowler's wicket. Uh, and... Uh, that was, and then uh, later I saw W.G. Uh, when he left Gloucester, he started London County at the Crystal Palace, a uh, thing of his own, a sort of club of his own. He used to get all the first-class cricketers to come and play for him uh, on their days off against the counties and that sort of thing. And there I saw him make a hundred, with Ranchi the other end making another hundred, a very fine partnership. And then I saw him again, uh, the Hastings Festival. Oh, and I saw W.G. in one of the only two matches in which he played with Jack Hobbs. Oh, really? Or in which Jack Hobbs played with him. It, as he used to take the uh, London County team to the Oval, uh, right at the beginning of the season. This was Jack Hobbs' first appearance. I saw Jack yes. Hobbs play his first innings in first-class cricket. Made eighty odd. Mm. Ben, before we talk about Jack Hobbs and the others, I, I, was, I must tell you a bit yeah. more about W. G. Well, I want to ask, what was he like? As a well, man? Uh, oh well, of course he was a huge bulk of a chap. Uh, he was uh, the, a great thing about W. G. in his time was he was the great predominant figure of cricket, more so I think than any other uh, uh, individual since his time. And uh, he is a, a very big chap, and uh, uh, he. Uh, had a, a rather an odd stance uh, in that he, uh, he he cocked his left toe up. He had his left heel on the ground, cocked his uh, his uh, toe up, and uh, stood. And he also, in, in those days, stood and awaited the delivery of the ball when the when the uh, bowler was halfway through his run, fast bowler, with his bat off the ground. Uh, that is, uh, some comments have been made in recent years about uh, uh, modern batsmen who've done that, uh, Tony Gregg and Amos and Brearley and, and so on, and uh, Gooch, that was, you know, and, uh, but it's, he started that, or he did it in his day. He was a, a very, uh, in, he was, a, I would think, uh, a, a, a humorous chap. He, he, uh, I don't think he was very sensible. Did you hear him talk? Yes, he had a, he had a, like another very large man, G.K. Chesterton, he had a curiously uh, a falsetto voice coming out of so huge a frame. <laughs> he, he was also, incidentally, you know, he was a practicing doctor. My mother was born and brought up in Clifton, and W.G. Grace was their family doctor. None of them lived very long. <laughs> oh, except one who 
Well, he's always be- playing cricket, I Well, she became a nun, and so he didn't give it to her, but the others all died for Did you ever see him disagree with an umpire? I mean, he's got this reputation. Disagree? When he made his hundred at the... Uh, uh, he, uh, well, I saw him make his hundred, he was caught at short leg by a pro called Brockwell, a Surrey pro off the bowling of Lockwood, for 24 or 22 or something. And uh, he made out that this was a bump ball, he hit the ball on the ground before. And he flourished, he went towards Brockwell, flourishing his bat over his head as if he was going to fell him. And of course, the, the umpire appeared who stood there, he, Utterly intimidated, not like what to gave him not out, and so he went on to make a hundred. Uh, well, that was W.G., wonderful character. Of course, you must remember uh, uh, the, 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 the days he lived in, quite apart from the cricket conditions. Think, you must remember W.G. never saw an aeroplane. W.G. never saw any type of motion picture. They were, they were very... How did they arrive different. at the ground in those days, in a dog cart or oh, I, no, I, will, I should think uh, uh, some of the professionals probably went on bicycles and tricycles, and uh, uh, certainly horse, horse and carriages. Handsome cabs, was Handsome cabs, yes. But, but uh, handsome cabs, not so much outside London. They were sort of a metropolitan vehicle. Ben, I must say, if I may, that your performance in scaling these stairs to the commentary box, <laughs> which floor me, and had done for three seasons, I think it was a prodigious effort. Yeah, and, and arrived in full puff, too. Yes, well, I, I don't take more exercise than I can help now. <coughs> I take an immense amount of mental exercise, perpetual mental exercise, but not more physical exercise. Like that. Uh, I'm I don't want to be unkind, but I think I'm rather like some of the English batsmen. I take a lot of mental exercise, but not much physical exercise. We're talking of mental exercise. Are you broody at the moment? Are you writing a, a Oh, yeah, I'm always, always doing that. I write it while yeah. I'm writing my next words. Oh, yes, darling, I've got two or three ways. Uh, we don't want to talk about no, that, but no. about cricket. Yes, I do, I do. <laughs> but I what a wonderful it. life it must have been before the First World War, a life of... Yes, well, uh, what about Jessup? People, shall I, would, yeah. you, uh, would you like me to tell you about that? I would love yes. it. Because yeah. I think I must be rather unique. I can't be many people about now who saw Jessup's classic, 104. The Oval in 1902? Uh, the Oval in 1902, uh, took it out of my mouth, and, uh, uh, oh, it was a wonderful occasion. That was... Uh, a very interesting test match. Uh, the Australians had already won the Ashes, and this was the last test match at the Oval. And uh, in the last innings, well, it wasn't a particularly bad wicket, I don't think, but it was. A, there was a bowler there called Saunders, a left left arm, uh, fastish um, uh, Australian bowler, sort of predecessor of Davidson. The way so he wasn't as good a bowler as Davidson. A few people were, I think. And uh, he, at the second innings, England had to make 263 to win. And the first four batsmen on the English side were McLaren, L.C.H. Pallaret, J.T. Tilsley, and Tom Hayward. And Saunders got them all four out for, respectively, Two, six, naught, and seven. And this is just about F.S. Jackson then went in and, and stayed there, pretty good, but this just about the luncheon interval, this last day. And these four wickets were all down, all to Saunders. The other end, old Hugh Trumbull was bowling. He'd had eight wickets for 64 in the first innings, so he, he was a menace. And uh, some, I remember, sitting on the right of the pavilion. And an old, I watched there some of these old, or rather elderly, members in the, left the ground disgruntled. They couldn't bear to see England so humiliated. Well, Brond came in with Jackson Lap Lunch was immediately out for two. And in came G.L. Jessup. Jackson, well, I'm a wonderful defensive performance, most sensible innings. 
at the other end, Jessup went absolutely crazy. He, this menace, Saunders had already dismissed all our star batsmen. Jessup hit him for four falls uh, uh, in the square leg and the long arm district. A huge trouble was burned at the other end. Jessup hit him onto the uh, awning in the pavilion. Ball came back, he hit him there again, the next ball. <laughs> it was a set, and so he went on. And the, in those days, the enthusiasm was absolute, because England had utterly no chance at all. Okay? But hadn't they? This thing began to dawn, this paint up with this man going crazy. And in those days, the boater hat was the fashion. Everybody wore a boater hat. And I remember when Joseph made his century, stayed citizens in the, in the uh, removed their bowler hats and threw them like boomerangs into the air. <laughs> Unlike boomerangs, they didn't return to the <laughs> well, as a, a severe a loss in those, a great sacrifice. They, they must have cost at least three shillings a, a, a time. Oh, a wonderful sight. And, of course, the most thrilling thing of all, the finish of that, because when, uh, uh, when he was out and Rhodes came in to join her, they wanted 15 runs for the last wicket. And a most canny bit of bowling. Uh, oh, shoot, uh, well, they, they made them gradually and uh, drew up to the score was a tie. And uh, Hugh Trumbull from the pavilion end would bowl, bowl right through the innings. 263, about 31 overs, then. and uh, he had a chap called Duff, a very good opening Australian uh, batsman and a good, good field. He, he had him a, a deep long arm on the right of the pavilion, the, the over, what later always became known as Sandham's Corner, because Andy Sandham used to say. And, uh, he served Wilfred Rhodes up with a slow half volley on the next time. Almost any batsman or anybody in the world would have said, Oh, here we are, crack wallop, hit it into the air and get caught by that. Not a bit of it. Wilfred Rhodes gently tapped it past square leg and ran the one run and there was that. You've made a lot of tours of Australia, haven't you? Uh, yes, I've been to Australia several times. Uh, I, I, I was there very luckily in 1928, 29, when Bradman first, I saw Bradman play his first innings in Brisbane. Uh, uh, yes, and uh, against England, English bowling, that is. And, oh, uh, it was a, a great tour. It had, of course, a wonderful side. England had probably one of the best they'd ever. Percy Chapman was the one say, and Jardine taking making his first tour. Farmer White, they were the three amateurs, the days of amateur and professionals, of course. And Jack Hobbs, Sutcliffe, who made the, the greatest. I always say, Brian, that the, I think the greatest innings I ever saw the cricket, the Test match, anyhow, was an innings played by Jack Hobbs at Melbourne. Uh, the last days of 1928 was a test match, the third test match at Melbourne. And Jack Hobbs made 49. And I think that 49 was the greatest innings I ever seen. It had a terrific, of course, the wickets weren't covered in those days, uh, the mercy of the elements. And uh, it had a tremendous thunderstorm the night before. And uh, uh, and the sun, the Melbourne, the Australian sun came out next morning and fairly baked the wicket. And uh, Australians still had two or three weeks to lose. Palmer White polished them off in a couple of overs. And Jack Hobbs said, said I'm afraid we shall, this was lunch, the, 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 the start was late. And Jack Hobbs said, I'm afraid we'll all be out by tea time. <laughs> and at the end, Tea time, he and Sutcliffe were still there, and that was the worst. That must have been the most, the worst batting wicket 
any bollock had ever conceived. I went and saw it at the end of the play. Uh, it, was, it was like concrete with great lumps and holes in it. It was utterly terrible. What about the best batsman? Have you ever worked out who you think the best batsman you've ever seen, the best bowler? And there so? are two kinds of batsmen, aren't there, Brian? Surely. There's the batsman who says, I'm going to slaughter you, and the batsman who says, you can't get me out. The greatest batsman, I think the greatest slaughterer I ever saw was undoubtedly Don Bradman. The greatest you can't get me out of was Jack Hobbs. And of course there were others like that. It, it's the approach to the game, not merely the execution, but the mental approach to the game. Uh, I think, I think uh, you, you can't get me out as, of course they can uh, make to uh, play uh, ex terrific scoring innings, past innings if uh, circumstances arise, but there's sort of a general attitude to it. Hutton, Woodfall, Bill Laurie, you remember John, Indeed, you remember yeah. Bill Laurie. <laughs> uh, uh, a boycott. Yes. And then, and then, of course, all the other slaughterers, there are many. Well, we had one yesterday. Uh, it's hard to believe, watching that innings yesterday, that there could ever be a better slaughter of cricket. But I think Don Bradman must have be at tops. Mm -hmm. And, of course, the all, greatest all-rounder I ever saw was that Gary Sobers. I don't suppose there's much argument about that. No, not know. at all. Yeah. Bowlers? Well, uh, the uh, traditional greatest bowler is Sidney Barnes. I suppose the Australians would put in a case for O'Reilly. Uh, and we had some uh, always very good medium bowlers. Morris Tate, Alec Benson. Uh, it, well, it's awfully hard to say. Of course, the greatest classic bowling performances like Lakers and uh, 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 Verity. uh, Verities at Lords of 1934, they got 15 wickets. And, but they were done, I, 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 I don't want to detract from the brilliance of their performance, but surely they were done under circumstances which helped the bowler. Absolutely straightforward. I, I suppose it doesn't hasn't stopped improving altogether, I hope, cricket. Uh, this guy is a pretty good bowler, isn't he? He's pretty useful, yes. And, of course, the fielding is better now, isn't it, well, than it's ever course. been before? Well, of course. That's the only thing, John. The, the fielding compared now... Of course, there is the one thing about this one-day game, which I don't think is cricket at all, apart from being awfully good fun and entertainment. And, uh, and, and you and Jim Lake and between you managed to make the very interesting, exciting on Sundays, but uh, the fielding and throwing, of the, you know in the old days, I'm talking about the race Jessup day, uh, oh, until quite a, a long time after, throwing to the wicket always used to be on the long hop. People didn't throw poor pitch to the wicket keeper, uh, and now some of those will tell you, see, Lever and people that will turn the ball, you've seen some quite good ones this morning. Uh, it's a delight. I love watching fielding. That's one of my things. You I'm use the word watching. Did you ever play, Ben? Were you any good? Well, no, no, no. <laughs> much too small. Oh, no, I love fielding. I think uh, Percy Chapman was the greatest all-round fielder I've ever seen. There have been some awfully good come. Do you remember uh, before Randall? Do you remember that chap Bland? Mm -hmm. Colin Bland. Colin Bland. Yes. And, uh, well, uh, Clive, Clive Lloyd went there. Right. Right. A, bit, a little bit a year or two ago, my word, what a menace he was. And, and slipped. P uh, Phil Sharp was the best slip cash oh, I What about Jack Hobbs at cover? Awfully good, awfully good and quick. So was Jessup. And Hobbs uh, uh, wasn't all that uh, good when he started. He, he, he taught himself to be a great coach. Very good return to the world. Uh, yeah, he was very good, but uh, I, I love uh, And then uh, to go back to batting for a moment, the thing I'm always, always pleased with, mind you, I'm only a spectator. I don't for a moment pretend to, to be an expert or a connoisseur. I secretly, like all cricket lovers, I secretly think I am myself, because I never <laughs> tell them about this. But, uh, and, uh, I, elegance. I love elegance in that. I, the, the, 
most, the, the most graceful, elegant batsman I ever saw was Alan Kippax. And he was an Australian. Yeah. Uh, to watch him was an absolute joy, his movement. And we've had a, a great Tom Do you see Trumper? Oh, yes. Well, how great was he? He was great. But he wasn't all that graceful. He was supposed to be, but he wasn't. He had an extraordinary stance with his right knee bent of, uh, in front of him. Front of him. I saw, yes, uh, uh, he was, of course, terrific. When, when I saw Bradman play his first innings, and he made a, at Sydney, in the, Sydney in 1928, and he made a glorious cover drive. And an excited member in the Australian stand jumped up and said, Trumper! And he was damn nearly lynched. <laughs> Blasphemy. Did you think then that Bradman was going to be the great player? Did you think when you saw him then? Well, yes, we'd been told beforehand there were two chaps who were up and coming great cricketers uh, Archie Jackson and Don Bradman. Of course, poor Archie Jackson would have been, I think, but uh, he had that consumption died young, but, uh, oh, Bradman, yes, he was terrific. Do you like watching wicketkeepers? Who do you rate as the great wicketkeepers? The greatest wicketkeeper I ever saw, oh, of course, I think Alan not. I think that that's improved. Bertie Oldfield, my younger, is always supposed to be the best, and then he was superseded by Evans, and now uh, Alan not. But it was a very strange wicketkeeper, a marvellous wicketkeeper in my younger days, who was still going strong, not weed keeping still, but still going strong, called, you know him, uh, Howard Levitt, Hopper Levitt. Hopper Levitt. He's here today. <laughs> he used to stand up for fast bowling. Of course, he couldn't do it today, unless he wore a pair of stilts. <laughs> <laughs> that could rather handicap with weed keeping, I think. But he, he was an amazing chap. And, oh yes, there was some... Just one more question, Ben, if we can. Uh, you wrote one farce about cricket called A Bit of a, a Test. A Bit of a Test, yes. I did that rarely. Uh, it was, wasn't uh, expected to be a very, uh, to appeal to a very large public. It, it was after uh, Douglas Jardine's tour with Larwood, the bodyline row. And it was a, it was a sort of skit up from that. What was Ray Flynn? Was he captain of England? No, I'm afraid Robinson <laughs> Hare was <laughs> <laughs> oh, purgatory, but he, he, he went in first with Ray Fibber, yes. And Tom Walls, what was he, the villain? Oh, no, Tom Walls merely produced, I think. I don't think, I think he kept us. I used to have great fun with Robinson Crusoe. You know, yes. Robinson Glass, well, dear yeah. old Crusoe. Marvellous chap. Oh, what fun, you know. But then, when you know, he was doing, a, picking a world team of those you would like, of world's history, you would like to see playing cricket, playing in the test match. I had a wonderful opening pair, Beethoven and John the Baptist. <laughs> Look, on that note, we, we've got and, 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 and then we had Attila, the Hun, and me the fast bowler, and Tork Pomada, the spinner, and two glorious umpires, Judge Jeffries and Pontius Pilate. <laughs> well, on that note, we've got to stop in. I've got a magnificent choice. And we've had 25 minutes of absolute magic. And I tell you what, if it's yeah. raining at a test match, can we ring you up at your flat and say, come round at once and entertain us? Yes. Thank you. <laughs> there you are. Ben Thank Travers, you for some money delights. The great passer and the great cricket lover. Thank you very much, Ben. Sadly, Ben died just a few months later, so we were never able to ask him back. But what an extraordinary memory and what a wonderful cricket-watching life he must have had.